Hey, everybody. So, uh, are we getting sound? Everything looking, sounding good? Thank you guys for all joining. What's up, David, Robert, Graham? Oh, great. Okay, cool. Hey, so I'm going to play a little bit, and then, uh, you know, we'll talk. Stop that track there. Great. So it looks like everything's sounding great. Um, that's that's a big improvement for last make uh, last week. So we're making strides. That's good news. Um, thank you guys for uh, for joining in. Um, as you can hear, we're doing film noir kind of guitar soloing here. So this is a bizarre title for something like this, but um, you know, basically it's the music that supports film noir kind of. Film. So, you know, the dark kind of French films of Hollywood and France in the 30s and 40s. Um, so this music is has to serve one role, and it's to create a mood. So we're trying to create a mood of uh, danger or mystery or sexual tension. or um, And it's usually, you know, a lot of these movies are based on crime or they're based on like the cities, like seedy underbelly. Um, so it's really fun as a soloist to try to support that. And I found the best thing to do is really kind of get an image in your mind and kind of start from there of what kind of mood do I want to set. Um, and uh, that's really what kind of drives this is just what kind of space am I trying to get a listener to be in here. So 
there are a lot of, you know, conceptual tricks that get you there. Um, and I'm going to share some of the ones that I do that I've, you know, learned from listening to a lot of this music um, and uh, share them with you. So I'll, another resource, too, I just want to point out um, before I get into it is, uh, you know, there's a great playlist on Spotify uh, if you just type in Film Noir and, you know, that's like five hours worth of this kind of music that all falls underneath this umbrella. Um, but a lot of Miles Davis, Henry Mancini, uh, Chet Baker, um, if you guys are Twin Peaks fans, music from Twin, Twin Peaks is very much film noir style. Um, anyway, so check that out if you can. Uh, it's a lot of fun listening. Um, all right, so let me talk a little bit about tone up top. And uh, pull the mic down. There we go. Okay. So no lag. That's great. I'm psyched. So let's talk a little bit about tone. Um, I go pretty clean. You know, I if an amp's a little on the edge of breakup, that's cool. But I don't really want to hear super overdriven amp sounds when I'm doing this. Uh, so right now I'm just going direct through the Apollo Twin. I'm just using, uh, I think, a Pete Thorne amp modeler plugin for my clean sound, uh, which sounds pretty good. Um, but normally I lean on like you know Fender amps and um, and for reverb with with this stuff I don't use slap. Um, and when I use reverb, I don't really use spring reverb if I can help it. I mean, if I'm on a gig and I want to do this, whatever. I'm not getting picky. I'm just going to turn up the spring reverb. But uh, I like a darker reverb for this. So I might lean towards uh, like a plate or like an echo chamber type of sound and darken it up. And that's not just my own taste. That's really a big part of the sound of these records. You listen back to, you know, the John Barry soundtrack records for all the James Bond stuff and um, the Henry Mancini records. And a lot of this stuff is echo chambers and plates and they're really warm sounding reverbs. So that's what I'm using today. I'm just using a plate reverb. So um, I really like the one that's in the Apollo. Um, if I, on a gig, um, you know, most of these uh, pedals, like reverb pedals, will have some kind of plate. I would choose that as a starting point. Um, I've used the Fender one, um, and the plate sounds really good in that. Um, you know, the Flint I was using for a while, and I had a nice plate. All right, so that's that's where I lean reverb-wise for this stuff. Um, the other thing that I should mention is about motion. Because we're playing a lot of long notes and we're leaving a lot of space, um, I want to make sure that I have some kind of movement happening as a note is decaying. So that's kind of why I chose this guitar today, uh, rather than something without a Bigsby. Because as a note decays, if I use vibrato, I could get movement into a note. You know, I could I could make it feel like it's moving forward and it has momentum, even though it's kind of decaying away. So to give you an example, so as this note's kind of fading, just that little bit of movement just kind of keeps it alive. In other words, it just, it keeps the listener from checking out is really what you're doing. So as that note's decaying away, when a listener would kind of stop listening to it or stop paying attention, a little bit of that movement happening could do that. So now if you don't have a big speed, um, tremolo will serve the same role here. So that will give you movement. So tremolo will do the same thing. Um, so those are like the tone considerations for this. Um, oh, hey, Jason, what's up, man? Uh, okay, uh, so I guess... We're having a little problem with the uh, notation and tab th um, link. Uh, sorry about that. I will definitely fix that after this, uh, after a little live session here. Um, okay, so we talked about tone. Let me go on to 
some of the uh, oh, oh, Graham says the one in the description works. Okay, there we go. So let's talk about scales first. Um, there's a universal scale that will kind of work for everything um, over this track I was playing over, and that would be the natural minor scale. And actually, you know what, before I kind of get into that, let me back up for a second and just talk about this track. So the track is in E minor, and we have four bars of E minor, four bars of A minor, two bars of E minor, and then a pretty common turnaround for a minor progression like this, which is a flat six chord. So I'm doing a C or C7 um, to a B7 dominant five chord. There's one measure each on those to two measures of E minor. Okay, so there you go. So that's that's the track that I'm playing over. So for soloing, like I said, one of the universal scales that you can use that will kind of act as a highway to get you from core tone to core tone would be the natural minor scale. So quickly, uh, what the formula for that is, is root two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, root. And it repeats again. And you could honestly just do this here in open position. Same notes as the G major scale. That's the relative major scale or major key. So they share all the same notes, just an F sharp, that's it. Um, that will work over the E minor. That will work over this A minor chord. And it will work over the C. The one thing that we do have to make a little change for is that B7. So whenever we get to the B7, because there's a D sharp and a, a B7 chord, we have to make sure that we're addressing the quality of that chord. So all of our Ds have to come up to a D sharp. Make sure we're bringing attention to that because it just does not sound good to have a D sharp in a chord especially if it's a third, a note that's giving the chord its quality, and you're soloing with that D natural or flat three against it. Um, not always a great sound. So, okay, let me just show you a little example. So I'm gonna solo a little bit with this E minor, uh, natural minor scale, and just target chord tones, but I'm just using that scale, and the ol only alteration I'll make is when I go to that B7. All right. Here's that change. Okay, so even without a lot of the bells and whistles that I'm gonna show you in a minute here, just how I solo um, and using that one scale basically kind of gets me pretty close to this world without making too many adjustments. Again, I am targeting chord tones and I am trying to play with good phrasing and using all the things that I talk about in lessons and in the channel, all the compositional devices and, um, you know, call and answer phrasing and things like that. Um, but that gets me pretty close, gets me in this world. So now let's come at it from a different perspective. Let's, let's try to get a little bit more in depth with this. Um, another scale that you could use with all this is the melodic minor scale. This usually tends to be a scale that I think most of my students try to avoid for the longest time possible. Um, and mostly because, you know, they're never sure really where to use the thing. So this is a great spot to use it. I don't really use it as a universal scale for every chord. Um, when I'm playing over E minor, I'm going to use the corresponding melodic minor scale. So I'm going to use an E melodic minor. So what's the difference between a natural minor and a melodic minor? 
Well, a natural, natural minor, like I said, has the uh, root 2, flat 3, 4, 5, flat 6, flat 7, root. And the melodic minor, minor borrows two notes from the major scale, borrows the 6 and the 7. So we have root 2, flat 3, 4, 5, a 6 from the major scale, just an unflatted 6, 7 from the major scale, to the root. Okay, it's a very different sound. And then we have that in the next octave. And one of the nice things about it is we get that pull back into the root. You get that seven to root phenomenon that wants to desperately pull back and resolve to the root. Okay, so now when I'm playing over the A minor chord, I'm going to use a corresponding melodic minor for that. So I'll do this in A minor just so you have a visual of it. These are all things that are great to learn. Um, so I got root, two, flat, three, four, five, the six from the major scale, that F sharp, the seven from the major scale, the G sharp, back to the A. There's your six. Seven. Okay, so these things sound really good against the chord. Um, and one of the reasons that they sound good is because you're kind of bringing attention to this tonality of minor six chords, minor major seven chords, minor six nine chords, uh, uh, minor six chords with a major seven. So I'm going to play these things all together in harmony first, and then I'll go back and I'll solo with this melodic minor. And uh, I think it will make a little bit more sense. You'll hear kind of what I'm trying to get the, where I'm trying to get the listener's ear. So if I take that E minor and I add in a six from that melodic minor, I get that sound. Really great sound. And anywhere you have a minor shape, you could go through and just change your fives to a six or just simply add in a C sharp and you'll get that sound. Here's one up here. The little PDF that I attach has like a bunch of different voicings for this uh, and just common ones that I use a lot. Okay, so there's that minor six sound. The other sound I was talking about was the minor major seven sound. Another great sound. So it's an E minor root flat three five, but instead of having a root on top or say a flat seven, you have a major seven, borrowing that major seven. Great sound. Um, now you could also put those things together. Um, you could get a six and a seven together. And I think that's how I opened up that solo actually was I was playing, because I do this voicing for it a lot, where I have the root up on top, the major seven on the second string, the G, uh, D sharp, C sharp, the six on the G string, third string, uh, my second finger there on the G, the third of the chord. And if you want, you could throw a low E on the bottom. Great. I just love all those chords. Um, they immediately make me happy. Here's another one that's kind of cool. So that's taking the six and putting it on the bottom. You can kind of see it coming out of this E minor chord up top here. Six on the bottom. There's that C sharp, G, B at the 12th fret. And then the major seven up on the top. Another nice one. Okay. Um, and then one I think I haven't talked about yet was the minor. Really, it's a minor add nine because you don't want a flat seven in there. So nine is the same as the two. You just got to get it far enough away from the root. E, G, B. There's a root. Flat three, five of E minor. Throw a nine up on top. 
you go. Okay, so the melodic minor helps us kind of tap into all those sounds as we're improvising. So I'm going to bring back up a track, and I'm going to use that melodic minor this time, and, you know, we could hear the difference. Okay, so now it's it's really getting us there. I hope you guys can hear that. A melodic minor definitely gets you in that world. Um, so now that we've kind of done that, there's a couple other little things that I want to talk about, and then you know we could open it up to kind of chat a little bit. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is some common chromatic movements. Um, these are things that you've heard probably a million times and they just work. They sound really great. They're kind of in the vernacular of this style. Um, so one is uh, somebody pointed out 007 before totally. So it's very John Barry vibes. Um, I don't know if you guys are a fan of John Barry's music, but you know, some of the best garage sale finds ever is just buying old James Bond soundtracks. Um, yep it should the uh hey so just a heads up before i talk about this um the uh link to the notation and tab will take you to a google drive that will have you know everything there for you to download um it should take you that if if you have any problems let me know but uh and if and if there's anything that's weird about it you know just of course, I'm not going to be able to fix it right now, but I'll just uh, I'll fix it tonight at some point, so you'll be able to get that PDF and the backing track, so you can play around with this stuff. Um, to just to get all this these free tabs and that backing track, um, you know, all I ask is you sign up for the mailing list and you have access to all this stuff. All right, so where was I? Uh, oh, the chromatic movement. Here we go. So the John Barry movement. Um, any of the fifths in a chord can climb up chromatically and you get that cliche kind of spy, you know, James Bondy type sound. Um, so I'm going to take like the fifth here, part of the E minor, you know, the B on the A string here. And I'm going to climb that up to the six. That's the flat six. There's your six barred from the major key back to the flat six and you could keep going from there if you want you could do the same thing on the A minor that's one of the things that happens in uh, that Barney Kessel does on that Julie London Recording of Crimea River, thinking the verses is. You have that movement on that minor one chord where the five is chromatically walking up and back down. So there's one cliche great chromatic movement, and it doesn't have to be down here on the bottom. You could put it in the upper register further away from the root. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Same thing that happens in uh, what's that Beatles tune? Um, uh, hey Bulldog. Hey Bulldog has that climb from the five. So five moving up to flat six to six. All right. So let's talk about another one here that I use. Well, let me try to use that one in the track, and then I'll talk about that last one. So this one's kind of fun. Here we go. Okay, so there's a good example of it. I was trying to put in some different voices. And then, um, so the other one that's common that I use a lot too is, this is super cliche, and this is, talk about a beatles -y thing to do. Uh, you know, my Michelle does this, and you just hear this all over the place. Uh, it also, uh, some, in something, there's this progression, and it's taking the root of this minor chord and walking it down chromatically. So that's getting you an E minor, an E minor major seven, an E minor seven, and then an E minor six chord. And you could do that with the four chord too. So there I was just walking the A down change my fingering so I could get access to that G sharp open to the G natural then F sharp on the bottom so that's another cool kind of chromatic movement um, I think now's a good time first let me say like all this information I'm talking about right now uh, I'm sorry if anyone's having problems with the link but we will fix that um, all this information can be found in the channel. So in the channel this month, um, I've added uh, three levels to this, along with the backing track, uh, and I go in a little bit more depth with everything um, and give you improvisational games to kind of get better at this. So all that stuff is in the channel. You know, it's cheap. It's $9.99 to sign up and get access to over 200 videos up in there. But um, if you don't want to bother with that, that's fine. No pressure. Uh, although I'd love to see you in there just because, you know, the more the merrier. Um, but if you do just want to, hey, I just want to check this out and work with the YouTube video, no worries. Uh, we'll get that link fixed if it's not working for some of you. And then, um, you know, you could download a backing track and, and notation from there. So, um, Man, now's a good time. I'm going to open it up, see if anyone has any questions, and uh, maybe I could help you out. Uh, Phil, isn't that called a line cliche? Um, yeah, I guess I don't. I don't. I guess I don't know what you mean, but like, yeah, I don't know. These cliches are are not a bad thing. They're a good thing, you know. They're the usually these indicators or. Um, signifiers of a style or a mood or something you know same thing like a, a lick you know a popular lick in a style it's a, it's something that could get a listener you know to a space or kind of um you know almost like cliff notes into into a world and then it's up to you to make more music out of it and do something with it but um robert thank you yeah i'm glad you're in the channel um can I talk about the whole tone scale? Yeah, Stephen, I'll talk about the whole. So, uh, there's actually opportunities to use that whole tone scale in here. Um, really, where do I use it? I use it on dominant chords that are acting as dominant chords. In other words, they have to have motion to them. They have to be going somewhere. So, a one chord going to a four chord, or say a five chord coming back to a one. You know, so functioning in like the classical way that uh, dominant chord is supposed to function. Um, now, whole tone scale works really well off of something like that, and I'll use the B7 chord from this to kind of give you 
an example. So if I use a whole tone scale over this B7, and the scale is exactly what you think, it's everything is just a whole step apart from each other. So I have B, C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F double sharp, A, B. So everything is a step away from each other. What's useful about it though, is it gets you into an altered five sound really quick. Because if I have B as my root, okay, the B is acting as a root. The C sharp is acting as a nine. That D sharp is acting as the third. That E sharp is acting as a flat five. The uh, F double sharp is acting as a sharp five. And we have A as the dominant seven. And then we're back to the root. So you're getting a nine, you're getting a flat five, a sharp five, and a dominant seven. So you're getting a lot of altered sounds by using that scale. So... Um, Um, I'll try to play it over the track and kind of give you a little example. And, uh, you know, we might, we might have varying degrees of, of success here as far as it's sounding good. Would I do it in this style? No, I wouldn't use it in this style. But, um, but I do use it over five chords. Um, here we go. Let's try it out. So I guess the problem with it here is we don't have enough time on that five chord coming out of that flat six. We're only on it for a measure and then to go into, um, it also kind of stylistically doesn't really work, but, but that's where I would use it on any five chord. So it gets you into, it's, you know, these things kind of, like we were using the melodic minor to get access to that harmony that we really like of the minor six chords or the minor major seven chords or minor at nine. Um, the whole tone scale is kind of serving the same purpose as getting you quick access to flat five, sharp five, dominant seven, and a nine. Um, that's how I'd use it. Now let me bring back up this chat again. Do tritone subs work with minor chords? Yeah. So instead of, um, I mean, the way I do it is instead of going dominant, I use a major seven. So if I was, uh, you know, let's say I'm not playing in this style for a second, I got E minor, A minor. Um, when I get to that five chord, the tritone is an F natural. So instead of what I would do in a major key, which is you know, use an F dominant seven, I would use an F major seven. So I do things like, um, and I'd like to like weave in and out of these things. So here's, you know, B seven to F major seven. Or you could go the other direction. I could start with the tritone sub. Um, And I'll give you a little more context harmonically. Um, so that's how I'd use tritone subs when I'm when I'm doing minor. You still go up to the tritone, but just change the quality from a dominant seven to a major seven. Uh, that's a good question, and I love that sound. That's a really cool sound. Uh, let's see. Who else? Thank you guys again for coming and hanging out, man. This is, uh, that was kind of look after our first one, you know, I was really looking forward to this. All right, Pete, 
do those noir minor chords work on jazz standards generally uh, like at the end of a two five one? No, I mean it just again, it depends. I don't I don't ever randomly put in chord qualities, so it would depend on a couple things. It would depend on what is the mood and what am I what am I trying to accomplish with the harmony. Um, I want to accomplish supporting whatever the vibe is or the mood is. Um, the other is I get a lot of my information from the melody of the song. That's why I always tell students, if you're learning a song, whether it's a country tune or a jazz standard or whatever, like learn the melody and go through and analyze the melody. Go through and write the scale degree numbers, how they relate to every chord that they're being played over, because that will give you a ton of information as far as what color notes you could put in your chords when you're comping um, and what things you could bring attention to when you're soloing. So if I was doing a 2-5-1 in a minor key, um, you know, to, uh, you know, or to that E minor, uh, it would really depend is... Was the did the melody have a flat seven in it? You know, was the melody kind of using a natural minor scale with a flat seven? Was it um, more bluesy sounding? Was it was the six in there at all, or was it always a flat six? If the melody was always, you know, if a, if a six was showing up but it was always flatted, I wouldn't randomly throw in a a six from the major key, uh, just because it would kind of break the illusion, you know, or the vibe that you set up. I hate using that word. Sorry about that. I'll find another one. But um, whatever, whatever, you know, that composer did to kind of set a certain uh, tonality with his chords and his melody, if you ignore it, you're just, you're, you're not really serving the song. So I'm always trying to like really look at the mel melody notes and pick my notes for my chords from there. I got a lot, a little long-winded, but I think you know what I mean. Um, let's see. Anyone else? Any other questions? Dave Mackey, man. Good question with the tritone subs. I'm going to scroll up here and see if uh, we got anything else. Um, hey, are you guys just having trouble getting into the Google Drive page? Where the notations are. Let me know if you are. It'll just help me troubleshoot it later. Uh, thank you, Hunter. Appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, anyone else? Man, what I would really love is if you guys were to take these this backing track and some of the things you learn here and, um, and try it out and tag me, you know, I just only just so I could just see what you guys are up to. You know, I'd love to see, um, how you guys solo over these changes and how you guys are navigating the scale and targeting chord tones. How long does it take me, Thomas? How long does it take me to learn a Chet Atkins song? And what's my process, man? It's, um, it's different for each tune. Um, they're all a little different. I mean, the early ones are, are quite similar, but um, it really depends. Um, I, the first one I learned, I, I think I tackled uh, Mr. Sandman first. Um, I don't have a thumb pick close by, otherwise I play it for it. But um, when I learned that one, I think I went, because I just, I didn't know what he was doing, at, you know, or what chord shapes he was using or when he was using his thumb. So the way I transcribed that first one, was I just transcribed like the bottom three strings first and then I transcribed the top three strings and then I put it together. Um, that's just, you know, how I, how I did it. So, um, and then it became clear when I put those things together and wrote it all out, it's like, Oh, he's using this shape, you know, and, and it was still, I made some tweaks from there. Um, after seeing, I really, after learning way more tunes of his and, and seeing some of the common shapes he uses and when he uses his thumb and when he doesn't, uh, a lot of a lot of plate right now. A little out of tune, but um, how he... Uh, 
he, how he uses the guitar was a real big lesson to me. And what I mean by that is how economical Chet is. I know it's it's a hard style of music to get into, and it's one of those styles that I'm forever always working on and interested in. But uh, and I'll never be him. No one will. You know, he was just he was the man. But what I take away from it is like, hey, you play guitar. Don't make yourself work harder than you have to. If you could play something with an open string, do it. Like lean into all the idiosyncrasies of the guitar. It's only going to make it more fun. It's uh, a little easier for you. <laughs> and it kind of celebrates the instrument a little bit more. Ugh, there we go. That was like my big takeaway from the Chet stuff. Um, and just his willingness to just change keys of any tune just to make sure it's in a guitar-friendly key. So... And he has some arrangement techniques, too, that I really like. We could do, like, a a whole YouTube live here on, on Chet's arrangements, which are which would be really fun. Because um, he has some stock things that he does with arranging that's, that's really cool. That's just something that I've, you know, used a million times. Um, and it's a great way to get a lot of mileage um, out of one idea. Anyway, so... Oh, okay. I see. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I'll, I'll tweak that. Uh, Jason says Google Drive needs permissions to set public. My mistake. So I'll tweak that and let you guys get in there and have access to all that. Um, how do you record the acoustic bass track? Will I hire an acoustic bass player? I think that's Mike Nordzi, um, who is great. Mike is one of my oldest friends, and he's a fantastic composer in his own right. Um, great bass player. Um, uh, and he was for the longest time doing this thing. Every day at three o'clock, he would he would just play walking bass and play a different set of standards. And he would give you a heads up before of like, here's what I'm going to play today. Here's all the keys. And it was just, he was basically giving you a live backing track to kind of solo over a bunch of jazz standards too. But uh, if you guys don't know him and his music, um, he was with me in the string gliders and uh, he has his own band called Moth Guts, which is a great noise, like free jazz noise. But I don't even know how you explain that band. It's like Ornat Coleman meets Sabbath. It's a great band. Um, really bizarre and fun. But he has a record that he put out like a year or two ago called uh, Shark Funeral Songbook. And I think there's a, you could find it on Bandcamp. Um, but go listen to that record. It's a really great, bizarre um soundscapey kind of record that it was one of my favorite records that year that it came out i really really loved it but yeah so you know i can't i can't do that stuff so if i need acoustic bass electric bass of course i could do you know when i'm making backing tracks and stuff but uh you know a tune like this or a track like this electric just ain't gonna get you there Um, oh, and so, yeah, so film noir and surf, yeah, they, they, uh, definitely film noir is a huge influence on surf music for sure. Um, so yeah, there is a, there is a connection there. Um, thanks David. Um, yeah. So, Hey, if you know, like I said, if you guys want to learn more about this, the channel is always the option. I'll fix that link. Um, there's a lot of other great stuff that went up in the channel this month. Um, I put uh, a whole bunch of common jazz chords, common jazz progressions, a couple of standards in there, some great new technical exercises. I had a lot of requests for tango and cash and soloing in, um, man, we're working on a lot of really fringe things right now, but soloing in like an exotica tiki style. This is, we're really on the outskirts. Um, which I was flattered that people asked about that that tune. So there's a whole lesson up there of three different levels of soloing with that and the chord changes and and some of the chords that I use to kind of accent everything with. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of other stuff, some new compositional devices. Anyway, please check it out if, if you can. Um, this track that we're playing over is coming from the Rockabilly Survival Guide for Rhythm Guitar. 
uh, which is a really fun survival guide. That was probably one of my favorite ones I did, even though there's no soloing in it, but there's just a lot of different styles. Um, and there's a lot of cool harmony going on. It's not just, uh, not just stray cats, you know, the whole time, but, um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Um, let me do a little housekeeping before we kind of call this one first. Thank you guys all for joining in and hanging out. Um, like I said, it's, this is something I really look forward to and I love sharing this stuff with you and saying hi and hearing all the questions. Uh, thank you guys to Phil. Everybody thank Phil for helping out here. He's a, he's a, you know, big part of why this works smoothly and looks good and sounds good. Um, and uh, to my buddy Jeff Macrolane, who is not going live this Saturday, because I think it's 4th of July this Saturday, but we'll be back, I'm sure, on Wednesday uh, at, uh, was he doing, 4 p.m. for another YouTube Live lesson, and then I'm sure he has a great guest. Maybe Phil knows what who the guest is the week after that. Uh, please be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and click that bell so I can let you know about new videos when I post them. And when we're going live, and um, what else here? What else do I have to tell you about? I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah, I think we covered everything. So, you know, reach out to me if you have any questions about this, of course. And, uh, you know, I hope to guys, see you guys soon in, a, in another lesson. I'm not sure what the topic will be for next week, but, you know, feel free to make requests. I'll try to make it something fun again. All right, talk to you soon.